Welcome to the Long Range Pursuit Podcast, presented by Gunworks, where we learn about and share long-range shooting techniques, science, and gear. Okay, welcome to the Long Range Pursuit Podcast. Uh, this week, we have Jacob Roach from Quiet Cat. Uh, you are the co-president at Quiet Cat. Uh, you uh, were at the founding, or had, did you come in a little bit later in the conception of this company? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm co-founder. Co-founder. Uh, it, it actually, there's quite a neat story there. Um, I have an identical twin brother, and my brother and I founded the company together, and we really found it out of passion, but we were looking for ways to access hunting properties quietly. And our tra- our hunting um, expeditions were always travel related. So we wanted something very, very portable. And that started in 2012. So that was a day ago. Um, <laughs> we were early adopters into that e-bike space and really for the focus of overbuilt, rugged, capable products. And actually first, the first coin was meant for hunting. That was the purpose. Very cool. Um, we've known a lot since then, but yeah. The uh, that the founder story is always interesting because it usually it's not easy, and that that's why that's why I asked the you know president or founder because you know, they're not the same. A founder has a, a little different taste on what that company means and and what the products mean. So very cool story. So did I meet you at Shot Show or did I meet your twin brother? Because the face looks familiar. Uh, you met. <laughs> You actually met Justin at Scott Show. I was okay. uh, I had vacated out of there. I think um, a day or so before you guys linked up with Justin and with Andy. Yeah, you guys are identical. I have a set of twin boys that are identical. They're twenty two now, but uh, oh, it, wow. it took a, it took a few years before you know they started really developing their own personalities. Well, that's a special thing. The identical side is a lot different than the other side of twins, um, and. You know, there's a special bond that forms there. Um, Justin and I have been in business together um, for for many, many years. I mean, we started our first company in 2001, and then we launched Quieta, as I mentioned, in 2012, and we're still together. Um, Very we cool. Run the company, we run the company. We both have our silos, but today we run Quieta. We're approaching 60 people inside our walls. Um, and we've got quite a breath, and especially our focus is the rugged outdoors. I mean, that is Quiet Cat's main core focus is providing the, the best, most capable, durable, excess product, and excess meaning accessing the, the backcountry. And it could be the back 40. It doesn't need to be backcountry. It could be your private ranch. It could be, you know, a whitetail world where you're just trying to get to the back of a long cornfield quietly and not sweating. So, um, the most capable, rugged, all-terrain, powerful e-bike out there. Well, you know, uh, the uh, funny connection here is is my son Derek, one of the twin boys, works for me. I've tried really hard to to not give my my children an easy path into our company, but he just he gravitates there. Uh, I remember when he was a little kid, you know, twelve years old, traveling with us internationally. Uh, to either hunt or to go do training events or whatever. So th- this guy's been around the space so much. It just, it just oozes out of his pores. This project that we're doing, this Skunk Works project that we're talking about on today's podcast, it came from him. This is his idea. This is his, he's championed this program. And, and he's probably had a, a hand in, in 75% of our Skunk Works projects. So it, it, it is, it's, it's great to have, you know, that passion and that drive and that, um, that immersion in a space. And you guys have been here forever, just like Derek. But, you know, we, we outlined this Skunk Works project and we're going to call it the track. And it kind of, kind of fits, you know, the, the concept of what we're doing. But we, we came to you guys um, as a, as a, kind of an anchor to what we're doing here. And the goal was to make this backcountry accessible kit uh, or, you know, farmland accessible kit, or like you said, travel 
you know, accessible kit. So this is super lightweight. You take one of these e-bikes, you can put it in the back of a, a car and you can go somewhere and unlimber your gear and you can get on the trail and you can get access. Um, so the, the, the concept for the track was, you know, that accessibility. And what we did in the Skunk Works is, is generally we'll go find three or four brands that can contribute to a project. Uh, originally, this was a collective type uh, a scope, but we, we've partnered with uh, you guys, with Kafaru, and with MTD. And the way the kit came together is we've got your uh, Quiet Cat Apex, and we've accessorized it, put mud flaps and all that stuff on it. Uh, we put some bags on it, uh, kitted it out just like the way we would want a, a bike. In fact, most of the guys in the company have kind of bought one for themselves because it's it's really cool once you drive one it's it's over you have to have one uh and then we 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 put together a uh an mtd chassis so we've got a we've got a super lightweight magnesium frame carbon fiber chassis that um the guys over at mtd uh sent us a sample over a year ago and said hey check this out this thing's pretty cool so we've been looking for an opportunity to use this you know a reason why and then and then we kind of got into this um uh, jam up where we had this awesome rifle and we have this bike and I know you guys have a rifle carrier on the front but when you have a ten thousand dollar rifle it, it kind of freaked us out just a little bit having a having it mounted there on the front without yeah. some protection well, you know and, and being a user and being quite familiar with what you're talking about and even your son that's 22 years old that's not that probably doesn't need the help because he's aging right he's just looking to be to take it to the next level. Oh, yeah. I personally, I personally put everything on my back. Like I don't, you know, I don't necessarily like to put the gun rack on the, on the bike because like you said, what if you crash or what if it, or what if you're going through some narrow trees or what if something happens where it goes flying out of that rack? I, like I can manage it on my back. I can weave and bob through some hanging branches or such. But that's where I feel, whether it's a gun or a bow, um, you know, a really well equipped backpack carrying all of my gear. Yeah. Is how I roll. And that's a well, good, we, and that's a good one. That, and that's where we ended up with Kafaro. And and these guys are these guys were really excited to work with us and same with us. But uh comes cool news. They they're just moving from Colorado to Wyoming. Uh, just Riverton, two and a half hours away from us. So they've been up a couple times, but they went through a prototype process and built us a scabbard for this rifle system that fits in this new Hellbender uh, backpack. I think they're just announced it today or this week. Um, so it, it'll, it'll be announced before this podcast airs, but uh, it, it's, it is a really nice piece of kit. And, and they were so awesome to work with. So now we've got this uh, Apex you know, quiet cat bike. We've got this MTD chassis with a, with a gunwork system built on top of it. And then we've got this, uh, Kafaru Hellbender pack. And the last kit there in the, in the, in the system was the rifle scope. We did a, we did one of the Vortex Razor light hunters and it, it made a really super rifle system. And you fold the stock up in a 16 and a half inch barrel. The whole thing fits down inside of the pack. It doesn't even stick above the frame of the pack. It is so compact. And that so convenient to carry. Yeah, it is really cool. I can't. Well, I can't wait. I can't wait to see one and even get my hands on one of those. Um, oh yeah. I'm hiking around the back country and take, you know, getting past the crowds. You know, um, what what was there? The licensed hunting sales were up thirty percent or something uh, through the pandemic. And what that means is that that first mile is pretty crowded right now <laughs> in all of the woods, right? So. Part of that is how do you get past the crowd to enjoy the experience that you really went out there to see? That's a great um, point. That is a it, great point. It takes, yeah, it takes a little effort. It takes a little thought. You got to think outside that box and getting back there and, and being portable and, and having uh, your weapon in a backpack along with everything else that you'll need for that experience, whether your meals or, um, or even if you're camping or um, your gear, if, if the weather changes. Um, yeah, getting past the crowds is key to the experience today. Well, I'll tell you, I am, uh, I got old all of a sudden, like five years ago. And mm -hmm. it's such a cliche, but literally I turned 40. I started on the downhill slope and I got to, I got to get this thing turned around. But what I noticed is the, the horseback hunting for me became 
a, a lot more enjoyable chasing elk up in the mountains. It cover more country. You know, you get an elk down. It's so much easier to get it out. And maybe it's just, maybe I'm getting old. Maybe I'm getting smarter. One of the two. But we have this, we have this really cool elk hunt that we do. And, and we put in every year, uh, all the kids, all the family. Last year is the first year one of us didn't draw. But generally, I have so many kids and my wife and, you know, buddies at work. Somebody always draws this elk tag. And if you hike in, you got about a three and a half hour hike. And you can get to the base of the mountain. Then you got to get up the mountain and you set up on this ridge and we can cover a massive amount of country. And if we can shoot 1,000, 1,200 yards with, with a, you know, a rifle or the shooter, you know, we, we can, usually we're successful. I think I calculated once I'm like 76% of the time that we hike into that spot, we shoot an elk. And in some of those, are, we'll camp out, you know, there's a little spring there. We got this bench, we got this awesome little hidey hole, but that percentage for that place is just amazing for us. And as we've, as we've started using horses more, it's literally about 35 minutes to get to that spot. So we can wake up in the morning at, at, at our, at my house, throw horses in the horse trailer, be at the trailhead and then be at the base of that mountain before the sun's come up. And we can be up on that hillside just waiting and have that opportunity. And the recovery is kind of a drag, but I think all of that time gathering horses, and sometimes the horses aren't happy at four o'clock in the morning, you know, on the roundup, you could literally have your bike in the back of the truck. And I'm telling you, I am doing this. The, The next time we draw that tag, I will have my quiet cat on that trail and it, it will take us 20 minutes to get to the, yep. to, to the base of that hill. It's not the first time that we've called the quiet cat your modern day horse. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And it doesn't, it doesn't buck you off and you don't have to feed it. Um, well, maybe a little battery juice. Um, but you know, even with that the amount of relationships that, that we've cultivated with ranches that are even that do horse trips, take hunters out on horses. But sometimes, you know, especially if you have the right terrain and it's not like a wilderness area where you can't use bicycles, um, yep. you know, the quiet cat and that a, a, a product that has the capability and the durability to get you there makes a lot of sense. Um, and it is actually quieter. And, you know, one other thing to think about when you're hunting on these uh, on, on, on bikes, if you will, is that it's not the predatorial noise of a rolling tire is not a footstep by a human. Um, even though sometimes you roll over leaves or little sticks and they crack, but that's not the same thing as a foot hitting the ground. And from a distance that time and time and time again of a foot, foot, foot walking, that is what scares a lot of animals because they've learned that over time. Pretty yeah, I could see, I could see that I can see every single one of these developed and maintained horse trails that we have in the West being fair game for quick, easy, you know, low overhead access, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it's to get that extra mile or two in before the crowd comes, or it's just to avoid the, you know, the hassle of the horseback hunt, which I love, by the way, it really is great, but I kind of actually am a real efficient minded hunter. You look at the rifle systems we develop. Yeah. It's there's obviously experience is great, but it's like, I'm there to be successful and to come out with meat and horns and, and sometimes it's about getting it done rather than just, you know, enjoying it. But the, I think the, the bike's pretty cool. I, I have, as we've done this project, I've had this, I've just been astounded at why haven't I bought a bike before? I've known about these. I've watched them. We've looked at them. We've touched them at the shows. It's like, why have I had this barrier to buying one of these bikes? And well, it, you know, the timing, your timing's not late because it's still super early adoption, actually, in the category right now. Um, like I mentioned, we started in 2012. And back then, when we started and we launched our first two wheeled bike, which is kind of what you see today, the first one that we had launched in 2015. And really, more times than not, people couldn't believe that there was a motor in there. Now, today, that's a different story, right? But what I'm getting at is that um, the innovation has increased a lot in the last five years. And today, it's it's more reliable than it was yesterday. And it's much more reliable. And I'm talking about from the motors 
to the gearing, to the battery, and to the whole connectivity is just more reliable. And guess what? Next year or next tomorrow, it's even going there because this category is still in its beginning stages. Yeah. Well, I think I think probably the success that we've seen over the last few years with Tesla, I think, has really proven the concept that the systems, you know, this electricity transportation the systems are reliable I, they're going to work so i i think you know, that you mentioned, yeah yeah you met, and you mentioned that about systems and and of course tesla you know breaking the ground and you know everybody understanding how that works and then all the other automobile manufacturers getting into it but then bringing it back to the bike and to a quiet cat particularly in the back country i mean one Thing to think about that you're like well okay if i use the bike and i use up all the energy now what do i do right but there are solar panels that you just plug into the battery so that when you're not actually riding it you can recharge it to a full state um in in areas like wyoming and colorado where there is large amounts of sun sh uh, sun generally you can charge a battery full um what, at the same rate that you plug it into the wall yeah, and you can swap a battery too. And you can they're swap not, batteries. Yeah. Yeah, they're not Absolutely. that they're not that significant. Uh, I I always I kind of joked with some guys. It's like you just hunt in uphill, <laughs> right? <laughs> then you've keep always the got to keep the wind in your face. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. So what do you what do you think? I've tried to analyze why I haven't bought one. I'm kind of a technology guy, and I what do you think the main hang up is for? you know, not purchasing a bike, an e-bike? Um, well, you know, for sure on a product of an e-bike, um, as far as the quality, like a gun, you pay, um, you get what you pay for, right? So on a premium level uh, brand or product like Quietcat, um, you know, they're not, they're not cheap. You know, I mean, a good, a good product to get you and be reliable into the back country is going to cost you four to $8,000 um, at retail levels. And that's an investment. Now, a lot of that investment can be justified, right? Because now you might even use it to get to work or you might use it to go visit your friends or gather groceries. Because remember, our products are really based around utility. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not a hunting bike, it's a utility bike. It's meant to carry, it's meant to tow, it's meant to load up. But to answer your questions, the studies show that 15% of US market is probably gonna own a bike in the next 10 years. Well, if you, if you divide that out by the number of people in the United States, and then wow. probably even deeper in the rural communities where there's actually more use for it, right? That, that percentage is probably higher where we're using it for hunting, for access, um, maybe as an ATV replacement. I mean, there's going to be 40, 50,000, a million, sorry, uh, bikes being purchased over the next 10 years. Um, so the adoption's happening, the adoption's new. Um, it's, it can be vehicle replacement for your local community uh, commuting. Um, and I think eventually most people that are really interested and see the efficiency of it will own one of these. And you the know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I was surprised. I was surprised at how much power was there. Like that, that's the thing that impressed me the most is it's not a toy. Like it's not this little supplemental juice that's there. Like it is snap your head back, hold on tight because it is going to move. Yeah. That and there's two, and, and there's two things that make that and, and particularly on the apex model. Now the apex model, uh, is, um, um, purposely designed to be a speed sensor versus a torque because there's two different types of sensors that can make the boat that the motor that makes the bike go forward through the motor there's a speed sensor and the difference of them is a speed sensor you put it it goes on the level that you're at so if you're at level one it only gives you one you go all the way up to five it gives you five and there's no difference depending on how hard you pedal the power return is the same and that's really good for when you're loaded it up with a big heavy pack and um and you're towing something or you got your bike loaded up because you just have this consistent power and it doesn't matter if you're pedaling or not yeah the other side of that is what's called torque sensor and the torque sensor motors are on our more what we would call overland bikes versus hunting bikes and those it feeds you back depending on what you give it so it senses 
what you're pressing, the harder you press, the more it feeds back to you. So the, uh, for the hunt purpose and for the backcountry, um, we specifically designed the Apex to utilize the internal uh, motor speed sensor, um, which is uh, which is the right way to go. Yeah, no, uh, I can see that. I can see that. The uh, yeah, you don't want to yeah because of the terrain, you don't want to have that unlimited. Uh, and, and, open and sometimes ended. you're rock crawling, right? Sometimes yeah. you're going through a rock garden or something like that, and you want to. And you don't even want to use your pedals. I mean, shoot, your feet might be kind of flailing out. You just want to hit it and know what you're going to go through, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, it's that was probably, that for me, that was the biggest uh, exciting revelation that I got from it. And I'll tell you, as soon as I as soon as soon I used a, one of those bikes for the first time, the the very first thought that I had wasn't the this special elk hunt and the hunting access. It literally was, I love biking. And I like to push hard and ride fast. I have tree trunks for legs and it, you know, I can really push. And my wife's this dainty little, you know, skinny, not athletic. And I like riding with her, but I don't like going so slow that she can keep up with me. And my, my, instantly my first thought was, holy smokes, all of a sudden we're biking together now because That's she can good. push the button and I can push the pedals and we'll match up. You evened out playing field. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Well, um, I yeah. think I think the technology side, you know, the reliability, the the ex, you know, the distance you can go, the power, you know, the quality, all of those things were factors that I identified as as questions. Uh, the power thing is amazing. Talk to me a little bit about range. Like, what's realistic range with uh, one of these bikes? Yeah, so that's a great question because it really varies depending on terrain and the weight, right? Um, so. If you wanted to just like, again, even the playing field on flat terrain on that apex bike, you're going to get about 30 miles if you never stroke the pedals once. Now, depending on what kind of wattage with your tree trunk legs, you might put another <laughs> three, four, 500 watts into there, right? Yeah. So you're going to go. And so if you're taking that off of the bike, you're going to go further. And your wife or somebody else might be like, you know what, I'm going to pedal, but I'm not putting much into it. Um, so again, I mean, you could go 50 miles with pedaling, but let's just talk about the non-pedal because that's easier. 30 miles flat terrain. Now let's add in variability. I've got 80 pounds on my back, or I've got rough terrain of going through mud, snow, grass, hills up and down, right? All of those variables have different levels of range attached to it. So it's really easy to say, like, conservatively, that Apex bike is going to go 25 miles, and you can be confident in, in that. Um, and uh, and that's probably working the pedals a little bit. But when you're out in the backcountry, you're actually doing a hunt. You're not really pedaling that much. You know, you might be kind of standing, sure. you might be balancing. Um, but through that terrain, weighted up, 25 miles on that Apex bike is going to be a conservative safeguard to say how far you can go. Yeah, I'm sitting here picturing some of these really crazy horse trails that have some elevation gain. Like even if you derated that uh, 25 miles, you know, 20%, 30%, we're still talking about 15 miles of power. And if you do, it, you know, if you do get a bunch of elevation, which is going to take your battery down, that also means coming out. You're well, right. You're... I mean, what you go up, you must come down. Yeah. Um, so... So yes, and and again, those are pretty conservative numbers for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, in the Elkwoods where I feel like I'm going deep back country, which you can do around here and you can do in Wyoming and different in Illinois where I do a lot of whitetail hunting. Um, two examples, if I'm going back for a long back country and, and one thing I never want to do is turn around because I feel like I'm gonna run out of battery, right? That's just like, yeah. oh, that, 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 that didn't fit the purpose. Carrying an extra battery in that backpack is not that big of a deal. Um, leave it once you once you know once you're landed at your final destination of parking your bike, if you will. Ah, take out the extra weight, and leave it with the bike, right? Um, but that comfort of knowing that you can always replace the batteries. Yeah. What now, What does it I take? Have, how, I never do. How much time does it take to swap a battery? Oh, uh, shoot. 30 seconds. And what's less. the weight? What's the weight of a spare battery? 
Uh, Apex batteries are probably about 15 pounds. They're not yeah. like, because remember, it, it's just, it's a, they're all lithium, Panasonic lithium cells in sure. there. They're not super light, but they are condensed, high quality Panasonic batteries. That, those are the guys that make the Tesla batteries, right? Yes, they do. That's a partnership yeah. with Tesla. Yep. Yeah, very yep. cool. So if, if, uh, if, you t- if you do an extra battery, you throw it in the saddlebags, you're never going to see that weight. It's not going to be on your back. And you're going to motor in and it's always there. And it's no matter what, you've got enough to get back out. So Absolutely. it's the same. Yeah. So yeah. I think, I think yeah. in the, in the, where we hunt, I would do that. I would probably grab a spare battery and t- keep it with me just as peace of mind. I yeah, think, you know, and, and accessories are accessories is really another interesting topic, right? Because the way we look at the bike is that it's the platform, kind of like your guns. You guys have your base yeah. platform. Yeah. Now, what are you going to add to that platform? And that's what you'll see with Quietcat. Like, even like, what can you add? I mean, you see that rack is integrated, right? That that rack, you can load it up. It's not a bolt on. It's part of the frame. It's 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 made with the bike. Yeah, you can load it up, and now so there's bags, and there's you can strap. I mean, you can strap on anything you want. Gun cases. You can strap on soft coolers. Yep. You can you can attach. Pretty much anything you want. Well, I'll tell, I'll tell you, I'm excited about the uh, trailer. Now, we when we when we spec this thing out, we looked at it and said, okay, what are what's kind of like the base accessories that everybody's going to want no matter what. But I I really think a lot of the guys that buy this bike or that buy this kit from us have to be interested in that trailer. Like that thing is so awesome. What's the what's the rating on that for pounds? It's over three hundred pounds, oh, isn't it? Three hundred and twenty three hundred pounds you can put in there. Um, you know, if you want it. Oh no, no, let me take that back. Three hundred pounds on the bike that the trailer is like one hundred and twenty five pounds. One hundred twenty five. Yeah, if you add more than that into a trailer, that gets awkward and just like the balancing thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the trailers are great. Overland trailers, right? I mean, these are the the tires on that trailer are pretty much the same as the tires on the bike. They're fat tires. They've got a lot of air. There's a little bit of suspension also. And again, you can load those trailers up. So that's two trips. Two trips for an elk, you know, boned out elk, unless you shoot a really big set of horns. Two trips on an elk. That's one trip on a deer. So that, I mean, that's a pretty nice little payload. And uh, I think that's a cool accessory. We just didn't feel like, every person that bought this kit would want it and it might gross up the price enough because you put one of these premium quiet cat bikes with a premium gunworks rifle and a, you know a high-end backpack all of a sudden you've got a pretty expensive kit so we we're always trying to make we're trying to make the best bang for the buck in the kit that apply uh, appeals to the best you know the best audience now, did i see um did i see you guys uh put those lights on it yeah Yep. Did, did you? I don't know if you noticed, but did you notice that at the board the light is red? At, on your first click, it shines red. Okay. And, cool. You know that was purposely because that's one of the colors that animals don't necessarily see. Yep. Yep. Right. So and then and then it's a different click, and you go to the right the thousand looms or two thousand looms of white light, but purposely we hit red um, because it's made for hunting. Right, it's made for access, and you don't want to like have this huge spotlight out there. Yeah. What um, uh, what what other accessories do you have on your bike? Light, um, saddlebags, so probably for sure, right? Yep, yep. Light and saddlebags, and and then um, I put on some fenders just to yep, try we to, got know, those. keep some stuff um, to keep you know not dirty. But then again, remember, for me, I prefer the stuff on my back. After that. So yeah, saddlebags are carrying like, and also carrying extra gear. Like if it, when you're way up there, what if the weather comes in and it's going to rain? Yeah. Right. Having that pretty accessible is nice. Um, you know, a lunch, you know, a soft cooler in there, all those types of things. Stuff that you planet. stuff that you may aren't necessarily going to need to go rummage through and stow in your backpack to go hunt. So keep the hunting kit contained yeah. keep the like the safety kit talking about safety kit um i know we on our kit that we put together we did the uh tire uh upgrade so you, you literally can't go flat that's, that's kind of a, a great, big deal that's a great partnership that yep. most tannis liners they're literally they don't get flat yeah you just don't get flat so I wanted to I wanted to eliminate that as a as a challenge that you have to deal with. But you you brought up a point about um, uh, earlier we were talking about the chain 
being a maintenance point. What are some other areas that you'd want to be just like w eyes wide open? You know, what would you put in your like safety well, kit or your toolkit? The first thing that uh, any user or and any writer wants to pay attention to is like how to avoid the problem first. And realistically, in the backcountry, if you are just thinking, if you stay and always start in your granny gear, your easy gear, that levels out where you're probably not going to break something because you're pushing the torque through the gearing instead of through a tough gear where the chain might want to snap. Because remember, you got a thousand watts of motor through there, plus whatever your legs are pushing, you could have 1500 watts pushing through that chain. And, and really being in the granny gears, the easy gears is the most simple way not to ever get there. So that's yeah. one thing is like learning how to ride the bike. Although it is a bike, it's a motorized bike, Learning what it, where it operates the best is the first piece. And then when you do break something in the back country, it's really simple to fix. I think the, uh, the, I, the point I was trying to make with that was there's only a few things that you have to watch for. The, your toolkit's going to be really small. You know, and you just want to just be able to repair your chain, you know, replace your battery if you need to, um, you know, probably go ahead and put a, a, a backup kit for a tire repair, um, even though we've we've taken some steps and added some uh, features that are going to make that very, very unlikely to ever have a problem. But if we if we just if we put a little kit together, literally, you're going to have you're going to have less maintenance problems than you have on a horse, I think. So I I think it's it's going to be pr pretty easy oh, to work with absolutely and what you need in the field is like you said it's very small you need your chain tool and you need your set of allen of allen wrenches that are made for the bike um and maybe maybe some air um but you have the tannis liner so you yeah. can ride that pretty flat anyway yeah yeah so already a big structure um, tannis yep tool. yep um yeah a small kit an understanding of what to do if something happens and and, and just knowing what to do to avoid the situation and you are safe. Okay, well, what, what are the other arguments that somebody would make for why they're not gonna buy a bike? I mean, like the power's there, the ease of use is there, the range is there, you know, the accessibility, all the features and benefits support, you know, a purchase. So is it just come down to cost? Is it just the dollar amount? It, it, it's cost and, the, and then some backcountry hunters the purest style of hunting right maybe some people have adverse um thoughts on what that means to be pure and get way back there and you shouldn't earn it so um, so they're wearing moccasins you know, right <laughs> they might be they might, you know they might be doing their final stock with with no shoes um but and then lastly what's changing drastically into the benefit and as a matter of fact i'm actually headed to washington dc at the end of the month to talk about the outdoor recreation and and where the future of it is right um but it's just about the rules in the public lands and where you can and can't use them and what we will see into the future right yeah um, well i think you've got the you've got the green movement on your side with this though there's a there's a unwavering support for you know e-vehicles so I, th I think they're perceived as green i think the automatic you know, adoption is there. So is, I think you've got a lot going for you on the reg side for that. Oh, absolutely. And also just, and just like where we started this conversation was, you know, the, the lands are getting crowded, but it's only at the fringe. And how do we get more people off of the fringe and into more of the usable land? That's all ours to use. And, and then and then that cultivates a better experience for everybody. And, and I think that's recognized generally by all. Um, and and just get back to the just get back just get back far enough where you can enjoy the experience. And you know what? If everybody gets to have that experience, that just grows and procures this awesome enjoyment of the outdoors and this industry and um, hunting yeah. and fishing and camping and getting back there you know yeah it's pretty cool i think uh, i think about a couple of the spots that we go camping um and just how that could enhance that recreation experience and then you know in the context of hunting man i'm sitting here adding up all these different places like a, a little sleeper event is the coyote hunting 
I think this in some of our, you know, like little rugged spots where, you, you know, maybe the you, you could only access with a ranger or something like that. It, now, all of a sudden, you can sneak in there with a with a bike that's not making any noise and set up on a stand, do some calls, you know, move into the next spot. Like even just a coyote hunt situation to me, and, and I always bring everything back to the things I like to do. So I'm Western hunting mountains, you know, it's this coyotes out on the plains. I even think about the, the antelope hunting that we do. Like Is even it, uh, th even that. And isn't coyote hunting um, generally about having lots of setups and keep moving? Yeah, exactly. Around. Same same thing with antelope hunting. And when they see a car, they're out of there. Like there's no way they're going to recognize a bike for the danger that is actually that that actually represents, you know. Well, I mean, all you really need to do at that stage is get a big cow outfit. <laughs> <laughs> and just oh man, around. that is so dirty. That's so <laughs> dirty cuz you know that would work. That would be awesome. It's all um, like a charm. Yeah. You know, I haven't spent a lot of time hunting uh, Midwest. We, we've done some flatland stuff uh, for, you know, whitetail mule deer, Sands Hill, Nebraska. You know, I can see this just marching all the way, you know, east. It's like it, it applies. You see all the, the tree stand hunting, all the accessibility stuff that's there. Like it literally applies everywhere. Uh, bears in tight country, logging road access. Although I, although I, although we live in Colorado, um, I'm not native here. I've been in, I've been in Colorado since 2005, but I we came from the east, and actually from Vermont, the hills of Vermont. But somehow, somewhere along that journey, I got I got bit by the whitetail hunting, and I was following all the counties of Illinois and this sure. and that. And in the in the 90s, um, I started you know. Um, purchasing land in Illinois. And my brother and I have put together a, a, a pretty nice piece of land that's really focused on whitetail. And we go there, we take our kids there, and it's, and it's just and it's a successful hunt because there's so much game out there, right? And big. As a matter of fact, my 11 year old shot a, a buck bigger than I've ever shot um, a couple of years ago. But um, my point is that we have catered this land to the quiet cat. And that means all, the network of trails for access and you don't make that predatorial sound of walking and you don't yeah. get sweated up. And as a matter of fact, I remember vividly one time um, I hunted the same stand two mornings in a row and I actually did it as a text, right? And I, and I parked my quiet cat about a hundred yards from the tree stand and I crept over with my rubber boots on and got into the stand. And it was one of those still mornings, it was frosty. So but those, the deer came in and it, was, and it was, it wasn't a pile, it was a pile, a group of does. They came in and they smelled where I walked. Like literally they got all, and they got all, and the wind was perfect in my face and I got all hockey. My bike was a hundred, I could see it. From, it was like a hundred yards away, tipped into this uh, brush and I, you know, tiptoed to the stand, got in. The next morning. I drove the bike right to the stand and put a pat on the other side of the stand. And it was almost like a mimic because it was like, you know, coming from feeding back to bedding. Sure. And it was probably the same group of deer. I guess. They came in and they never knew anything. Like the, the smell of my boots caught them, but me rolling those tires over that same mode path, they didn't get it. Huh. Interesting. You know, and, cool stuff. And that was just the, that's it. And that's the whitetail world, right? Not yeah. sweating, not smelling no predatorial sounds um so. you look at an uh we do an out ed hunt every spring and sometimes in the fall uh in west texas and there's there's lots of different ways to hunt texas but uh, one of my favorites is in the desert i love the desert we live in a desert here in wyoming in the bighorn basin and so that i always have an attraction for that terrain and then also that style of hunt you know it's fairly rugged you know, you get in the right place. You've got some pretty rugged stuff where you don't have the road access that you think that you would. Um, you you add a bike to that mix, and now Dad can be a real skittish animal. Now you can get a little bit further away from the roads, right? You can access some of the more rugged country without, you know, having to burn up all of your energy. You can cover more country, spend more time glassing, finding the animals. I mean, even we could probably outline any hunting situation in any state for almost every animal and find an opportunity where a bike could, you know, give you more chance for success and make your hunt more enjoyable. You know, um, 
we've had a we've had a, Texas is in our top five states of sales, um, and Quiaca is um, the hunt bike, right? And, and most know that brand around a, a vehicle made for hunting. One thing you do want to make sure in Texas is that you got the tennis sliders because those thorns oh, yeah. will pop your tire faster than you can even blink if you don't. But once you do, you puncture proof the tires up. I mean, you're right. I mean, you got you don't even necessarily need a Sendero or a road. I mean, if they're cattle run areas, those cattle make trails that you oh, yeah. can go yeah. through. Just weave slow, slow roll through the trails. And yeah. and you're right access more, get to areas that others aren't even seeing or, or, or trying to attempt to, to gain access to. There's yeah, I think, I think so. I'm, I'm sure excited about the, the units that I've bought for myself and my wife and, uh, you know, my, my kids, you know, use them a bunch. They're, uh, they haven't quite manned up to do the spend and buy them. Uh, you know, they're, they're young and they're still pretty frugal and they try to get away with as many, uh, toys as of dads as they possibly can. But, uh, you know, what, what I want to circle back to the cost issue, the, the bikes themselves are a premium product and we, we have no, you know, no concern about premium products. That's, that's the only way to do business in my opinion is to chase the quality and the value and the features and let the, let the that the price land where it's going to land so that you can make a sustainable company and, and bring new products to market and, and bring more value to the customers at, you know, now and into the future. But, you know, I think the, I think the price does bring up the question. Cause if you go start searching for e-bikes, you will find a hundred brands that you've never heard of that are making e-bikes and you're going to see prices that are, quite a bit less in some cases, you know, and if, if you're not really up to speed on, you know, the way that the motor mechanisms and the, the hub mechanisms and the batteries, battery systems, if you're not up to speed on how those differentiate, you know, it's, it's just like buying a, a mountain bike. You can go buy a bike at, at uh, one of the box stores for 150 bucks, but you can really easily spend 1500 bucks and it looks the same, but once you start shifting gears and you start, you know, wearing products and grabbing brakes and you're, you're going to feel those differences, you know, even as a, a novice, tell me why quiet cat, why premium? What's the, what's the main points that make it different? Well, absolutely. Um, well, a couple just on the top there is you're right. You know, at, as far as the components on the bike, as far as the components on any product, what makes up the premium product? Is quality components. That's first. Um, the next thing that you want to recognize is that the product is just one piece of the brand experience, right? And think about an e-bike or think about a car, think about something else with mechanics. The journey for that product through the life, I mean, not, not this year, maybe next year, maybe the year after, what happens then? And it's our partnerships not only through Quiet Cat, um, like with our service partnerships with Velofix, which is nationwide sprinter van maintenance, for example, or you know our dozen in-house full-time customer service people that are that are there to help the journey all the way through, um, is all part of the brand experience or the brand product, right? Um, so first, quality products, premium, and then the whole journey, like from start to finish, and then. You know what accessories match up with that like maybe like you said maybe next i'm going to get a trailer because i'm going to pack my camp with me too not just go on the hunt but also you mentioned like why quiet cat there are so many um e-bike brands out there i mean there's brands directly from china they'll ship it and you'll never talk to one person and it will come in a box and it's up to you to figure out chances are it's low-end components it's chinese battery it's not a panasonic battery it's probably Shoot, it might not even be truly legal to be in the U.S. <laughs> because it has to be UL certified. Um, but the back, but just bringing it back to like why Quietcat is, you know, our partnerships, the robust nature of our company behind our parent company just adds a lot of horsepower behind it. Um, again, continuing that entire entire journey. Um, the products that are engineered and thought about from the ground up to be meant for the outdoors, to be overbuilt and rugged. Um, 
And then just having a really good team, like I mentioned, I think earlier, like Justin and I started this company in 2012 and there was three of us. And now we're 63, right? So that team that we have in place from the experience of the purchase uh, to the experience of warranty, to the experience, like what else do I need? To the experience of innovation, um, all is what creates QuietCat that separates QuietCat. And I will say that QuietCat is, um, market share wise, we are, we have market share in this space, in this category of the hunt, the fish, the overland, that niche of the e-bike space, Quiet Cat has it. And because of that, um, we have more horsepower. Um, yeah. we, have, we have more capability. Yeah. I think, I think most people that kind of gravitate towards the premium space and i i I don't want to go say luxury but a little bit into that luxury space is is they recognize the value of the experience and it's the purchase experience the the training experience the the after sales support i i I think they recognize what that value is and without maybe being able to identify uh the appreciation the ability to invest money in engineering and R&D to make systems, for example, like all of your accessories and how nicely they fit the bike, how nicely they fit the application and they support the customer. It Accessories aren't free. Like the design of that accessory probably costs just as much as the design of, you know, a bike system. And so you put all this time and this money and energy into these little small touch points that the customer gets. I I actually think that kind of defines it's the essence of a, of a premium or high end brand. And I I think people that start to you know t- dip into those experiences, whether it's in a rifle system or a bike system or uh, e- you know even like this uh, 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 backpack system. You know, it's that's an expensive backpack. You know, all of those things, the touch points, we're not actually shipping the backpacks. We literally are shipping a gift card. They go directly to Kafaro and they get fitted because they don't want the guys right, just to get a pack. Them. It has to be the right one. That's once people start getting looped into that world, it's like you don't spend money on budget items you know you you do you spend once and you get burned and you you see the back end of that where there is nothing it's a it's this barren wasteland for support and for training and all that stuff i i think people quickly realize the value of a premium product but it's sometimes it's hard to get there initially but uh i I've actually done the research on the bikes. Like as we started looking at this, I said, well, wait a minute, let's justify this price because I'm, I'm an engineer guy. I like, I like to know. And so I started looking and that's exactly what I came on. And I, I'd love hearing you share why quiet cat, because literally that's the exact argument that I would make for why gun works. It's, it's the same. You know, yeah. And you know, as, as, as you and as me, and as, as we're, leading these brands and these companies uh, uh, to the consumer, I will tell you, and I promise that it is a lot more fun to get the stories of a premium product versus oh, yeah. the nightmares of an inferior product <laughs> in behind that. It, it just changes your mindset and it's a lot more fun to be doing that every day yeah. than, the, than the reverse. Yeah, exactly. 100%. Well, I think we've used up a lot of time. I really appreciate your time today. It was good to meet you. And you are identical to your brother. Like I'm going to have to spend some more time with you guys to be able to tell the the difference. And I do want to get uh, you looped in to one of these rifle systems. I think you're oh, gonna uh, you're gonna it, love it. I mean, that's a that's a, that's a done deal. Oh Justin yeah, absolutely. And I already talked about this. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, the problem is which one. So there's just so there's too many options to start with. Uh, it I had I struggled. I had the struggle train on the bike system as well. You know, not just picking for our customer. You know, on the Skunk Works kit, but myself. And so that yeah. it was kind of a challenge there too. But we're we're there, and I can't wait to start accessorizing that as well. well I will give you one. I'll give you one small lead. Is that um. I am left-handed on the shoot, so that, that's a good start. <laughs> yeah, we, we're there. My wife's left-handed, so I've always had to make sure we accommodate that, right? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, hey, it was really enjoyable talking with you guys. We're really looking forward to this partnership. I mean, it really makes a lot of sense. And this Gunworks project, that you, the Skunk Works project that you guys have rolling out with this portable, packable 
um, uh, long range, uh, truly a piece of uh, premium equipment for that purpose. I can't wait. I can't wait to get my hands yeah. on this. Yeah, basically, I, I, I it's kind of crass, but we make killing machines, man. And this kit that we've put together, like this is a stealth fighter, you know, get in there and get it done kind of kit. And I'm I'm pretty excited to use it this fall. I'm drawing an elk tag, I promise. And I'm going to do yeah, it. I've got two elk tags in my pocket uh, for this fall. One's in Colorado and that's four seasons. So that's over Thanksgiving and it is with a rifle. And then I've got a Utah and I've got a Utah. I mean, both of those are going to be quiet cat and centric. So I can't wait to test out the kit. And, uh, and then maybe we could do this again and, and trade some stories. Awesome. Sounds great. Let's do it. Follow up next year. Well, thanks listeners for uh, joining us again for another Long Range Pursuit podcast. I hope that you were able to get something from this discussion and, and maybe get a little more insight about how awesome this e-bike revolution that's just at the beginning stages is, and you might as well get one now and enjoy it for all the years of hunting and, and recreation that are in front of you. So uh, uh, make sure and check out our website for this Skunk Works package if you're interested in getting a bike, backpack, and rifle kit all together, or uh, check out the Quiet Cat website and see all the different offerings that they have and find out how to uh, uh, make a purchase, you know, for a, a you know, different model or a singular model as well. So, again, thanks for joining us and uh, we'll catch you the next time. If you like what you're hearing here, please take a second and give us a five star rating and a positive review on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. We appreciate your feedback and suggestions for topics you'd like discussed or questions you want answered on the podcast. You can reach out on Facebook or Instagram or send us an email to podcast at gunworks.com. Also, be sure and check out our full offering of long-range gear at gunworks.com. Use promo code LRP for free shipping on any order.